Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, Off Grid Comms and Power, um, and uh, we had a little bit of a, I guess, a technical issue in trying to get the video to work. But I'll post the slides online. Um, they're not really super needed. So more lecture, and um, we'll kind of go from there. So first um, disclaimer: uh, my opinions are expressly only my own, and do not express the views of my employer. Um, Always remember to uh, follow appropriate safety protocols and um, be sure that you understand what you're doing when working around electricity electricity, or RF transmissions, and of course, uh, don't be an idiot. Um, so yeah, my name is Justin. Um, I go by JDog Herman on uh, Twitter, on GitHub, and uh, you can find me on Keybase. Uh, I'm a hardware tinkerer. Um, I work as a penetration tester for a local firm in Cleveland. And uh, I'm also a ham operator and run the ham exams that uh, happened yesterday and will happen tomorrow. So if you're interested, if any of this stuff kind of um, draws your interest and you want to jump kind of feet first into uh, that world, come see me afterward and I can talk to you a little more. Um, I'm also an imposter, so I tricked you guys into coming here. So that was great. Uh, so shit hits the fan. Who, what, when, where, how, and why? It's really the basic question to be asked when you're thinking about how am I getting out of this particular problem? Um, you know, who are you going to be needing to communicate with? You're talking about comms. Um, what is happening around you? What, what sort of resources do you guys have that you can leverage in order to get back up and online? Where are you at or what sort of distances are you trying to cover or um, clear if you're trying to go from one location to another or um, uh, get connected? Uh, when might this happen? Is it happening you know, during the night or in the winter? Um, why are you having this sort of problem? And of course, how are you going to make it all successful? Um, I know that many of us uh, you know, have carried bug out bags, um, and I know that I'm, I'm no different than that. But uh, I think commonly we forget about how we're going to power all of our devices when we get out there. Um, once our batteries run dry and our battery pack our, uh, might, might go to empty, you know, we're going to be just like the plebeians running around without power. So when we're thinking about electronics, we're going to bring when thinking about um, emergency preparation, um, we really need to be thinking about where we'll be at and can you take it and the technical limitations of the other people that you're attempting to communicate with because it's, it's great if you understand how to communicate, but if no one else can reply back to you or, um, or really hear you, then um, it's all kind of for naught. So the most basic sense, everything everyone carries this this form of communication has a lot of um, ubiquitous opportunities. Is is obviously your cell phone. Uh, it's convenient. It's uh, readily available, but it's heavily dependent upon your network coverage and availability. Oh my God! Okay. No, th this is the wrong way. <laughs> um. Yeah, depending on network coverage and availability, um, I don't know if you guys have ever been in situations where uh, you have had um, poor cell coverage or um, uh, high utilization. You can see, be it even just a concert, uh, you're not able to make any sort of data transfer. You may have full bars, but the network's saturated, and uh, you're not going to get any messaging out, uh, or you'll be reduced down to the slowest possible um, methodologies. So some of the products that we uh, that I'm going to mention here and some of the techniques I'm going to talk about uh, involve using alternative methods beyond just relying on the cell service. And um, the first one is a, a product called Gotenna Mesh. Uh, it happens to be really small and convenient. Uh, it's a fairly new product. Um, it leverages the 900 megahertz and uh, as the name implies it offers mesh topology um, up to six hops including the final destination um, with end-to-end -end encryp encryption um, and it leverages the six, like I said 900, 900 megahertz and uh, links actually to your cell phone so you can send text back and forth, send GPS coordinates um, and, and doesn't require any sort of subscription service. It has a built-in battery pack so you kind of get a day's worth of usage, um, active usage when, when leveraging it and uh, it's an easy adoption. You can hand that out to you know your, your significant other or your, your kids and uh, they would be able to kind of un instantly understand they need to open up the app and uh, begin communicating. Gotenna Mesh. G-O-T-E-N-N-A Mesh. 
They run about $90 per each. You can buy them in a pack of two for $180. That's list price. Don't spend list price. Um, I always carry one to any of the cons that I have, so if, if you see anyone else, I know there's a few other people here that also carry them. Um, again, they opp opportunistically mesh um, and don't require any calibration or connection with that. Uh, next one, if you're a little bit further away, but you still want to get in connected with other people, is um, the device called the Spot Messenger. Um, it's uh, sort of on the waxing of their, of their product line, but it um, allows a one-way available messaging. So not only give you a tracking position, so you could hand that out to, um, you could let someone know that you're going to be heading out and have that particular device. You can send a quick message that you're safe or um, be able to send a waypoint of communications. It is subscription-based, and it runs about $150. It also has a, uh, a battery pack inside, so power for that. And it, I've seen those run for about 18 hours um, with active usage. Next is we're talking about voice. Um, there's FRS and MRS communications. Those are the family radio services and the general mobile radio services. Um, they are both really low cost to use, low, low barrier of entry, easy to hand out. Those are the Motorola's that you might find in a Target store in the clamshell pack and you pull them on out. A couple things to know about those though, you can't do any modifications to them based on their license. Uh, they are limited to two watts of power and you got preset channels um, that you can only leverage. The GMRS is a low cost license. I think it's like $75 for like five years, the FCC. But it does grant you the ability to have some peak power up to 50 watts. But again, fixed frequencies, fixed usage, uh, no data over those, those communications, and no point to multi-point um, ability. There's a no new one that's kind of on the scene, and that's uh, called the OtherNet or OuterNet. They've kind of been switching names. Um, it is a receive-only methodology. It, uh, it's fixed reception. It's basically on, done on global satellites. Uh, you can point your dish, uh, low-cost dish, at the particular point, and uh, they are constantly streaming um, news and education, weather. Um, you can actually send messages uh, out um, for subscription for other people. You, you drop it in their Looking Glass um, web app, and it will send it down to all the uh, all the recipients. Um, it is a sh slow process, but you know if you're at a fixed point, it can work fairly well if you're trying to get, again, the weather, what the stats are, and news that might be in the area. And uh, it's covert. Um, besides having to remain a stationary point, um, it won't require anyone to know that you're transmitting, that you're still receiving data or, or um, information. And then, of course, um, you know, there's license-based radio. Um, you can go to the FCC and, and petition them and request and license person certain bands to get access. Um, but I don't know if you guys are like me. I don't like to spend a whole lot of money. So that led me to ham radio. Um, you know, there's our HTs, which are the handy talkies carry around. Uh, there's mobile devices, which you know people use, sometimes use them on the desk, but a lot of times they'll put them inside their car. And um, also fixed base which are much larger uh, units that can live on your desk. Um, a lot of people think that that's just all analog and it's all old school stuff. Uh, nothing's kind of new or come out in the scene. But that's not entirely true. Um, there's actually DMR, which is a um, digital mode radio. It's kind of nice. Uh, there's several different techniques that are out there, um, including like D-Star and full DMR and um, I'm forgetting all the other plethora of different um, manufacturers, flavors. But um, you can actually get, you can actually create a project right now called the uh, DMR Hotspot and uh, uses a Raspberry Pi Zero and allows you to connect that device back into your cell phone if you wanted to, um, allowing others to jump on and jump back out through cellular service and uh, into other DMR networks um, by using linked technologies to different repeaters. Uh, it is licensed, so all of ham radio you need to be licensed, but the license is really cheap and easily get into. In fact, um, starting uh, tomorrow, we will have the exams, and those are actually all for free. Um, we uh, is wide capability. Lots of people are available to have access to it. But one of the key things is it's not encrypted. One technology that's commonly used in emergency situations regarding, uh, you know, like, let's say, uh, Katrina or uh, the, the um, Puerto Rico incidents uh, with uh, the, 
hurricanes was actually WinLink. Um, it is a ham technology, but it's a worldwide messaging service. Basically, you can send any message along this, um, this network, both wirelessly or through the internet, and it will send small emails, basically, uh, to be received by the pickup node um, for the recipient. And, uh, you know, it's a store and relay uh, type of system. And that was heavily used in, um, you know, C operations because you can send that on an HF band and have it available for pickup pretty much worldwide um, without having, needing to have an immediate link all the time. Came in the wrong direction. Nobody told me you had just, VG, just uh, HDMI. I got dis display port and VGA. So all these things are going to require power, though. Uh, you're, you're looking at uh, a couple nominal voltages, uh, 12 volts being between 11.5 uh, and 13.9. Commonly, the six-cell uh, lead-acid batteries. You find those a lot in you know uh, motor vehicles. Um, both uh, motorcycles and uh, cars and, and whatnot. And then, of course, uh, the ubiquitous 5 volts um, that uh, you can find in USBs. USB is not just 5 volts, though, so um, you want to be aware of that. Some of the newer charging methodologies allow for faster charging with 9 or 12 volt. Uh, and, of course, line voltage is 110 that might be available. Uh, each of your devices that you might want to charge or power using these particular methodologies um, it's usually more ideal to maintain at the lower voltages, uh, 12 volt or 5 volt, because a lot of the devices themselves, even if they plug into line voltage, then do a reduction, reduction and um, rectification. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try to invert a lower base voltage up to 120 and then back down into uh, a 5 volts that might be inside the device. So when figuring out which systems you're going to put in place in order to um, power these devices, it's, it's a good, good idea to think, okay, what, what can I do to maybe avoid that, those losses. Uh, USB batter banks, I know that everyone kind of carries them. Um, I had mentioned about the 5 and 9 and 12 volts. Um, you know, there's limitations for those to be on flights, but uh, usually not a big deal in emergency situations. Uh, the battery technologies that are kind of out there, when you're thinking about carrying around a battery, uh, you've got lead acids and lithium ions, lithium polymers, alkalines, um, of course, NiCad and nickel mahat hydroxide. Now, NiCad and nickel mahat hydroxide not really out there too much. I know a lot of people forget about uh, utilizing alkaline, but they are quite available um, and ubiquitous, and they're uh, easily leveraged and stored. They have a great uh, shelf life, but they're obviously not, they are re non reusable. Um, it comes back down to lead acid, which has got a lot of punch and power, but um, in kind of tried and true, the issue is weight when you're talking about remaining light and mobile, going from location to location. So you're coming back down to lithium ion and lithium polymer. A lot of people say, well, you know, lithium polymer sounds great. I've used my drones, able to fly them around to use lithium polymer. The problem with those is how temperamental they can be. Overcharge them, the battery pack starts to swell. You store them to in the, in the wrong location, battery pack starts, pack starts to swell. And then you've got a safety concern and how you're going to manage heat and control charging for it. Lithium ions, which include like the 18650 lithium ion um, phosphates, uh, batteries on lithium ion um, with iron, um, iron oxide technology, allows you to um, a fairly stable package, um, which is 18 millimeters in diameter and 60 millimeters tall, um, and are pretty much all laptop batteries. And so when I was beginning my project, I started out just by collecting those. Uh, I collected... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of battery packs. Um, I happened to uh, reach out to a couple small businesses and uh, let them know that I was going to be recycling them and they were happy to have a place that they didn't have to pay to have them taken away. Um, a lot of people said, well, why would, why would you keep all this around? You know, get some weird looks from the significant other. But the thing is that in most of these battery packs, only one or two of the cells have gone bad. And if you've got the uh, tools necessary and you understand the basic safety concerns when pulling them apart, and checking them for safety, um, you can get a lot of great use, a lot more charges and uses out of these uh, particular individual cells. So when you're checking for cells, you know, you're cracking open the, the battery pack and you might uh, check the physical cleaning of the cells. 
Um, you're going to pull off all the goo and whatnot that's there. You're going to be ripping off uh, usually the um, uh, nickel tabs that are on the edges that, that are um, sonically welded to it or, or um, spot welded. And you're going to usually start for a starting voltage. If the cell is below one volt uh, in a lithium ion battery, it's usually pretty close to dead and it should be put aside because it's not really worth your first phase of work. Uh, a lot of this is going to be in iterations as you, as you whittle down from a larger set of batteries into a smaller set of cells. Um, so once you've established that it's above a one volt, you've got a, a, a good candidate for testing. Uh, you begin with a controlled charge, usually at like a one amp charge rate, uh, until it reaches up to its uh, 4.2, 4.1 um, max voltage. Now each cell manufacturer has their own uh, unique max voltage to be available. Um, I found that you know if I use 4.2, I'm usually in a safe environment. Um, you do that through a constant voltage and a constant current, um, two different phases when charging. Once I reach full voltage, I'll do a controlled discharge, uh, usually usually about a one amp discharge rate, because I want to know if the cell can actually, how much it can actually put out. Um, once it reaches down into the about 2.2 volts, I'll go ahead and stop that discharge, identify how many milliamp hours, on, write that on the side of the battery, and then I will go ahead and recharge the cell back up to its full voltage. I then take that cell and let it sit. I usually let it sit about two to three weeks, uh, maybe sometimes a little longer, and I'll come back and I check to see what the voltage is after I've let it sit and wait. A lot of times, uh, bad cells, you may get a good amount of charge out of them the first iteration, but once you let them sit and wait, you'll find that the cell self-discharges uh, fairly quickly, and that means it's, got, it's built up a lot of internal resistance, which is um, not something you want to have when deciding to pair it with other cells. After that, you pretty much store them based on the uh, swaths of um, capacity. Uh, so, you know, your 2,000 um, milliamp hour, 2.5 um, amp hour, your 1 to 1 1.5, 1.5 to 2, and uh, you, you, you start building piles of those. The next thing you want to think about is how, what sort of size you're, you're going to want your pack to be, not only in your weight, in your configuration for uh, location, how large you want to store it, and uh, how much voltage you're actually trying to create. Um, you can, you may, when you're looking into some of these things, you'll see 3S or, or 20P or 3S80P or what do those really mean? The S stands for serial and the P stands for parallel. So a 3S 2P has got six total cells. Um, three of them are going to be, I'm sorry, six total cells, and uh, three of them are going to be in series. Two of them are going to be parallel. Um, it's going to give you around 12, around 12 volts. That's a good utilization. A 4S 20P, you know, that would give you a little higher of a voltage um, range of workability if, if a lot of your devices don't support working at lower, like uh, 9 and 10 um, uh, volts. Uh, there's also a 3S ADP. That's the one that I had chosen to make. I'm going to kick on. I'm going a little faster. Attaching them together, uh, a lot of people will take them and just duct tape them around. But you need to remember that the cells do create a bit of heat. Uh, so leaving a little space, you can actually purchase uh, tiny little spacers from AliExpress or Amazon. You can click on them, integrate them together. Um, when you're connecting them together, you could use uh, spot welding technologies or spring terminals. What I chose to use instead was actually soldering them. And I know that some people say, well, hold on, you're, you're overheating this part of the cell. But if you've already uh, abraded a bit of the top of the terminals when you're coming in and you've used flux while you're incorporating the um, soldering iron, your, your weld time on that particular terminal is very low, so you're actually not transferring a whole lot of heat to the individual cell body. The reason I chose soldering is one, I had it available, and two, uh, it allowed me to be able to fuse the particular cells together. I use fusible links, um, which have a, a fuse rate of um, two amps, so that way any cell that became overly discharged uh, too quickly, uh, that would blow that particular fuse. It's the same technique that's used in some of the Tesla vehicles and their battery packs, even though you, they leverage a different size cells now. You want to think about padding on the cells, you know, when it's... I'll stop there. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you can find me at, uh, like I said, keybase.io. Jared Herman, you can uh, reach me out at the Ham Talks. And, of course, uh, visit the ARL and Aries and Reese's. Thanks.